live, where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. It's November 2nd, 2014. Welcome to ABC7 Extra. I'm Maria Garcia. Glad you're with us. Tonight, we're bringing you a debate between the candidates for Texas's congressional district, uh, the 16th congressional district. Democrat Beto O'Rourke, elected in 2012, wants to go back to Washington. A lifelong El Pasoan, the former city representative, wants to continue his work, he says, creating opportunities for the border and for veterans. He also wants to focus on being accessible and accountable. The Republican the Republican challenger is Lieutenant Colonel Corey Rowett, a career Army officer who served overseas and has received several commendation medals. He also serves as president of his marketing company. Among his priorities, he says, job creation and securing the border. And the libertarian candidate, Jaime O. Perez, he's been a teacher and a business owner and says he wants to bring focus to reducing the country's deficit and a better tax structure. There's a lot at stake here. A lot of important issues that our lawmakers in Washington have to deal with. ISIS, veterans, the economy, Ebola, immigration. Time permitting, we're going to try to tackle all of those issues. And we want to hear from you. If you have questions for the candidates, make sure to email me tonight at abc7extra at kvia.com. You can also tweet me at MariaGABC7 or using the hashtag ABC7Extra. So let's get right to it. Joining me tonight, incumbent Beto O'Rourke. Republican challenger Corey Rowan and Libertarian challenger Jaime Operas. Thank you so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, so let's get straight to the issues. ISIS, a lot of people talking about that. Uh, the Obama administration has pretty much admitted they underestimated ISIS, uh, taking over practically every city up to the Iraqi border in Syria. Uh, we do know that initially the Obama administration thought there were about 10,000 ISIS fighters. Now we know they have. 30,000 plus. Several analysts saying that airstrikes just are not enough. Would you support more troops in Iraq? We'll, cut, we'll start with you, Congressman. I don't know. What we're missing right now in Iraq and the larger Middle East for that matter is a thoughtful, strategic approach to the issues, the peoples, and the countries there. It's why I'm 42 years old now, and when I was a senior in high school, we first announced airstrikes in Iraq. We've been in some form or other at war in Iraq for more than 20 years now. And I do not think that the current strategy with airstrikes and some so-called moderate opposition forces in Syria is going to do enough to achieve our aims, in part because this country has failed yet to define our aims and what success looks like, what a win would be, and what our ag exit strategy is. Until we go through the formal process of declaring war, which is outlined in the U.S. Constitution, I don't think we will take the del deliberation, the debate, and have the discussions necessary to come up with that necessary strategy. I am a voice for doing that in Congress, and that's why I voted against this most recent action. Okay. Uh, the Republican challenger, Corey Roy, we move on to you. Would you support troops in Iraq? More troops. As the only veteran sitting here on the, the platform tonight, and someone who's actually been in Iraq within the last 24 months, I know a lot what it's like going over there. So I understand that soldiers uh, do what soldiers do, and they go where soldiers are supposed to go. But right now, we don't have really what the mission is. As a military planner, which I've done for almost the last 30 years, we got to look at what the mission is. What is the mission? And then we'll figure out from there if we need to put troops on the ground. So personally, I think it's a huge security issue for the United States right now. This isn't just some social program that maybe we should cut or not. We really need to, to, sec to secure our borders to make sure uh, that we have a strong national defense here. But I'm for putting more soldiers over there. We don't necessarily need to put soldiers that are going to go and attack, but we should be building up a strong national defense because ISIS has said they want to come to the United States and kill us. Now, right now, the 800 soldiers that are there that we... They're, they're either securing the Baghdad airport or securing the U.S. Embassy. Are you saying we should send more soldiers there to do more things than that? We, number one, we shouldn't be telling them why that we're not going to send soldiers in, like President Obama has done. So we shouldn't say that. But soldiers should be trained up right now in the United States and forward deployed either in Kuwait or Iraq and, and just, you know, a strong defense. Let people know that we're there and if, if you go over that, cross that line, We'll be there to, we don't have so to wait six months to get uh, Army mobilized. 
Okay, all right. And moving on to the libertarian candidate, uh, Jaime Perez, would you support more troops in Iraq? Absolutely not. Uh, the real problem, or what's really going on, is that the economy is close to imploding because of the huge debt that we have. So the uh, thinking in Washington is that the only way that you can prop up the economy is by creating a war. And through the military expenditure, through the, through the um, funding of the military industrial complex, you'll be able to prop up the economy. That's what's really going on. And evidence of that is just what my colleagues just said. Because when uh, the congressman says that we don't know who we're fighting, we don't know how it's all happening and so on, it, it is evidence of the fact that um, ISIS has gone strong, ISIL has gone strong with equipment that was left behind. So here we have an exit strategy, the economy is imploding, so now we're trying to figure out how to get back in. Okay. All right. I want to talk about veterans. Uh, they fight for our country. They do what many people aren't brave enough to do. Yet when they get back home, they just can't see a doctor. It takes them a long time to see a doctor for serious illnesses, even for preventative care. Some veterans even though say they believe that the, the government whitewashes reports instead of holding the VA accountable for long wait times. A clear example of this, they say, is the lead investigator looking into long wait times at the Phoenix VA uh, concluded that he was unable to conclusively assert that long delays at the Phoenix VA healthcare system had caused patients to die. Uh, and some veterans say there's clear evidence that these veterans couldn't see a doctor and that some of them if they could have they would have still been living so what is your response to these veterans and we'll start with you mr roy again as a veteran myself who receives his medical care at the el paso va uh, i know all too well the issues over there so when i came back from deployment last year one of the first stops i made was over there to make sure i was registered so i could get some of the injuries that i occurred over there last year fixed uh, pretty they were pretty good about getting me in and uh, you know setting me up uh, with status and giving me an id card but then after that after my initial appointment i was really having a lot of difficulties getting follow-up appointments so it's critical one of my top priorities will be taking care of my fellow brethren who have served in combat like I have. But how do you do that? How do you keep people accountable in the VA? That seems to be the problem. We, we seem to acknowledge there's a problem, uh, but how do you get the people in charge to own up to that problem and to fix it? Accountability, number one. Uh, now, there was a bill that was passed in August that was really pretty good that I would have supported, but it hasn't went to that next step. In Stars and Stripes, <coughs> even this morning, uh, the Senate is basically saying that the, the new VA administrators really not putting that bill into full implementation. So we pass legislation, but it doesn't always get acted upon and put into play as quickly as it should. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Bettis, what would you do? Well, the most important thing, of course, is to put it in the radar of the Congress. And I think that Congressman uh, O'Rourke has done that to a large extent, um, certainly representing the 16th Congressional. Uh, I think a little more has to be done, but the most important thing is just to focus attention on the problem, and that's uh, really the crux of the matter. Now, that said, that's a good example of why we should not be going to war. The number of suicides in the military is enormous. The PTSD that uh, returning veterans is huge. I mean, we have very, very serious problems. And if we aren't capable as a nation to take care of the people that are going to go fight for us, how can we then ask more people to go and, and be uh, suffering the same, uh, the same condition? So um, it, the important thing is to keep talking about it and to keep uh, working on programs to deal with the issue. Now, it seems though like people are talking about it. Um, you know, we've, we've seen congressional hearings about it, uh, but nobody seems to own up to the problem. Uh, Congressman O'Rourke. I think that we've learned that you cannot trust the VA to tell us how the VA is doing, to your point about Phoenix and the investigation that followed there. And that is why we conducted a survey here in El Paso with an error margin of plus or minus about four and a half percent to find out for ourselves from veterans directly what the access issues were. And what we found is it takes up to 71 days to get a mental health care appointment, if you can get one at all. 
It takes about 85 days to get a primary health care appointment. And that's absolutely unacceptable, and it's completely disconnected to the numbers we were getting from the VA. From that and the attention that we were able to put on it, we got the acting VA secretary here to El Paso, who committed more funds to hire more providers so that we could see more of these veterans in a timely fashion. But I think your larger point about the cultural aspect of a lack of accountability and a premium paced on, placed on executives earning bonuses is, is well made. And we've got to make that cultural change within the VA to value accountability and outcomes for veterans above everything else. So what specific policy? I mean, how, how do we hold these people accountable? What would, what what would you one push? One specific policy uh, that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rowan mentioned earlier was this bill that passed this summer in August, which beyond providing another $16 billion to the VA to mm -hmm. hire more providers, also made it easier for the first time in the history of the VA for the secretary to fire underperforming uh, members of the senior executive service. In other words, they don't go through the normal civil service process. If they're in the way of making progress and getting better outcomes for veterans, they're out of the way. So that's a first good step in changing the culture and creating more accountability there. I but think we need to build enough. on that. It's not enough, no. And, and it's not going to be easy. It won't be overnight. It will not be solved by money. This is a very large, multi-billion dollar bureaucracy that will take years to turn around. I'm going to be part of that on the Veterans Affairs Committee. And Mr. Rowan, you said you support that piece of legislation. Yes. For the most part, it was a bipartisan bill. Just about everybody in the Senate and the House did vote for it. Okay. Uh, but I did want to refute two things he said. Is that possible? Sure. Uh, he, he's real proud that he's basically did that survey. But I'm saying for someone who was on city council for six years and then almost in Congress for two years, it shouldn't have been a survey that determined that there's issues there. That should have been quite a well in advance. And then the second thing is, although the, the VA, um, the one who's now running the VA, has this power to fire people, he hasn't been firing people. He's still letting the same people that have made the same mistakes continuing on. Oh, would you like to answer to that? Well, you know, in answer to the, to the secretary not exercising this new power, he, he literally just came on board uh, within the last couple of months. So um, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I think that the, the focus on accountability and the VA at large and the problems within it is a new one. And I think El Paso, through its leadership in Congress, has been able to bring some of that focus and that attention to bear on the problem. It will not be solved quickly and easily, and it will take all of us working very hard persistently to, to turn this around. But I'm starting to see positive changes in El Paso. I'm not satisfied, but we're making progress. Okay, thank you very much. We have to take a commercial break. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. You can tweet us your questions at MariaGABC7, or you can email them to us at abc 7 extra at kva.com. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. We're bringing you a debate today between the candidates vying for the seat for Texas's 16th Congressional District. We were talking about veterans' issues before. Uh, Jaime Opet is the Libertarian candidate. You, ha you wanted to say something. Yes, before just we uh, very briefly that the problem with the Veterans Administration is not unique. It is a problem with every single governmental bureaucracy, whether it's the IRS, uh, you know, uh, creating problems for people that they don't agree with politically, or any, uh, whether it's housing or homeland security, or you, you talk, any governmental bureaucracy is so huge with the bureau bureaucrats worrying more about how much they're going to get paid and how much they're going to spend, uh, you're going to find these kinds of problems. So it's a function of the huge bureaucracy that's the problem, not specific necessarily just to one. So how do we change that? You cut those bureaucracies. You have to streamline government. Government is too big. For every little problem, we create a whole new other bureaucracy. We're already hearing from my colleagues about spending. We don't have any money to spend. The country is in bankruptcy. And for any little problem, it says, how do we spend money? The question is, how do we create efficiency in government so that we can respond to the problems, identify those problems specifically, and then how do we um, tailor the, the bureaucracy to respond to those problems? Okay. Uh, I want to move on to immigration. Uh, Democrats voted for the uh, administration-backed plan to provide work permits to about 12 million illegal immigrants. Uh, what kind of immigration reform would you vote to see? And we'll start with you, Mr. Bettis. Um, I am in favor of a permit for people who are coming into the country that would not uh, give them a right to access public services uh, and would not give them access to citizenship. I do not believe in refugee status. Um, I think that for us to open the country to refugee status would invite immigrants from all over the world. It's basically an open borders position. And I don't think that's tenable. I don't think the country can afford it. And philosophically, if, you, if you've got people like uh, the, the jihadists and Islamists trying to get into the country to create uh, a problem in the United States, you don't want to have a no. You want to know who's coming here and why they're coming here. That said, if they're here, I think they should be able to come out of the shadows without fear that they're immediately going to be imprisoned or their children taken away. What about the people who say this is a country, though, and you hear this a lot, this is a country established by immigrants, and it's part of our value system to have a, a system, a legal system, that provides a path to citizenship to immigrants who work for it? Of course, and you make that distinction. I mean, we have a lot of people that have applied for uh, citizenship that have applied for residency that are following the protocols established. We have but laws in place. if you don't have place. refugee status, what if there's a worthy person who, who, who perhaps ca can uh, apply for refugee and legitimately get it? Refugee status. We are not the saviors of the world as many people would like to believe. And so there may be a lot of worthy people all over the world that want to come to the United States, but their worthiness is not a ticket for citizenship. They have to believe in this country. They have to want to be citizens of this country. And providing them with an opportunity to follow the path, the legal path of citizenship, I think that's, that's fair and that's proper and that's appropriate. But you cannot have a situation where people come uh, willy-nilly and, and then apply for refugee status because their home country is not so pleasant that's not going to work for the United States. Okay, thank you. Uh, Congressman O'Rourke, what kind of immigration reform would you see? Is it possible? Well, we had uh, comprehensive immigration reform pass the Senate with a strong majority, I believe 68 votes out of 100. A similar bill came to the House, and I and others who represent border communities improved that bill to take away a provision that would spend tens of billions of dollars to militarize the border, double the size of the Border Patrol and try to fix problems that frankly we don't have today. But beyond that, I've also authored legislation with, Republican, uh, with a Republican member of Congress, the American Families United Act, which would join the family members of U.S. citizens who, because of a technicality of immigration law, cannot enter this country. It would allow them to go before a federal judge and have that judge decide those cases on their merits. I think it's something that is fair for most people who I've talked to, Republicans, 
uh, and Democrats. And lastly, I think I've been a leading voice in the Congress on ensuring that we treat refugees and those who come to our country from places like Central America with the dignity and respect that are in the best traditions of this country, as you pointed out in, in your question. I, I think that's uh, representative of El Paso's values, and that's, those are the kinds of things that I'm going to continue to work on going forward. Now, we do know that the influx of immigrants who came from Central America, uh, those who were uh, appointed to an immigration court judge and who were given an immigration court date, a large majority of them did not show up to their court date. So we do know that the system we have for deporting them is not working. They're, they're in the country, they're here illegally, uh, millions of them. So what do you say to people who, who say, look, it, it's terrible what's happening in Honduras, but we can't just give them a court date and let them stay in the country because they're just not showing up to these court dates. Right. Well, we may be mixing populations here. There are not millions from Central America over the last two years. There are tens of thousands. And I'm most familiar with those who are being held in detention in Artesia, New Mexico right now. And of that population, a very small number, uh, a handful, uh, have been able to make bond and have been released. Uh, the vast majority are either still in detention or have been successfully deported back to their countries of origin. Uh, I think that when people are fleeing hardship, and in this case extreme hardship, the most violent communities in the world today, uh, I think we have a special responsibility to those people, and especially those with young children, to make sure that we take care of them, that we do not return them to those who would do them harm or potentially kill them, and again, act in the best traditions of this country. I think it's good for them. I think it's good for us as a country. And I think those are the kinds of people that we've always built the American uh, uh, civil society and American dream from. And so I, I hope that that will continue. Okay. Yes, and you're right, tens of thousands from Central America, uh, 60,000 I think was the last uh, estimate I read. Uh, Mr. Rowan, what kind of immigration reform would you like to see? I, I see it as a two phases. Number one, until the border is secured, we can't even go to phase two. So that was one of the biggest problems with the Senate bill. It basically at the same time said we're going to secure the border, but at the same time we're going to grant legal status to everybody, the 11 million people that are already here. So that was the problem with that. I say we got to go back. First we can secure the borders, and we can do that certainly with structures, with, with personnel, and with technology. We know how to do that. I would say the El Paso border for the most part is secure, but we got to look at the whole border, all the way from, from one end to the other. So until that border is secured, we can't even go to phase two. Uh, now, now, securing the border, how do you measure that? What kind of metrics do you, do you use? And, and, and s secondly, uh, if you speak to most lawmakers in the area, and, and as you mentioned, many people will tell you that the border is secure. So when resources are so, so incredibly special why do you spend why do you want to spend precious resources on a, on a problem that many people say just isn't a problem many people say it's not a problem but the large majority realize it is we we know that many many people are coming across the border these are terrorists these are cartels the, these are people that aren't all good, wonderful people. A lot of wonderful, good people do want to come to the United States, and we have a legal process for that. But the ones that just want to come here, there's plenty of uh, proof that they are getting through. While the Border Patrol is taking care of a lot of these children, leaves the border much more open to get through. But I think we can secure it. You asked me the question, how is that measurable? Uh, and I believe it can be. If you look at the fence we got down here in the border here, if you put, for the most part, that all the way from one end to the other, in some places that's not practical, where the, you know, where the real ground is real, real wide and some mountains. But you can definitely secure it and know who's coming, who's going. Then we can figure out what we want to do with the 11 million people that are here illegally right now. Okay. If, if I could, I'd like yes. to correct the record on, on one part of, of what uh, Mr. Rowan just said. Um, there have been no terrorists, um, no terrorist plots, and no terrorist organizations linked to the southern border ever. Not today not yesterday, not ever. And I've got that information directly from the director of the FBI, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, and the Secretary of Homeland Security. We have had terrorists enter this country at our airports. We have had terrorists cross at the northern border. And we have homegrown terrorists, fellow US citizens, who have become radicalized. But we've never had a terrorist successfully enter the US from the southern border. OK. But how long do we wait? From my military hat, we leave it open. ISIS, like I said in the opening, wants to come here and kill us. 
So do we wait until they come here and do something absolutely terrible, or do we secure but the borders But is that first? a decision based on fear or based on fact? I think it's based on fact. Sure, there's some fear mongering. But the, that, the head of the FBI happen. is saying there's no terrorists crossing through the southern but border. But ISIS says they want to come here and destroy us and kill us and go right. to New York. So wh where do we draw the line? Okay, if Mr. that Pence. is the position, though, I think it's untenable to have a position that he wants a, a, a wall across Canada. Terrorists have entered through Canada, through New York, and through Puerto Rico. So unless uh, the position is that we have to build a wall on, on the Atlantic coast all across Canada, it's just not a tenable position. You cannot have a wall be the answer to the immigration problem. You have to have a policy that allows people, those that want to pursue the American dream, that want to be citizens, I agree with that. But those that are crossing without going to the, the protocols, that is a completely different animal. Okay, and, and we have a, a, a question from one of our viewers. Mindy writes, my question is, would you support impeaching President Obama and reversing unconstitutional executive orders, uh, impeaching President Obama? To a lot of people that sounds radical, but I think it's a testament of how unpopular the president is right now. Uh, how would you respond to that, uh, Congressman Orr? No, I would not support uh, impeaching the president. And on this, this topic of executive actions, uh, I share the concern that uh, really not just during this presidency, but during presidencies uh, over the course of much of the last half of the 20th century and into this one, we have consolidated more and more power into the executive branch. And I think that is a, a very troubling trend. But I don't think that President Obama is exceptional uh, in, in this way. And, and uh, I think history has shown, if you look at the record, that he has uh, issued no.